Bienvenidos a todos y a todas de nuevo, gracias a los más de 250 conectados a la sesión. Seguimos adelante con la siguiente presentación. Presentamos a Agustín Formoso, es ingeniero de software en el equipo de I+.D. de Ripen CC y nos presentará debogonizando el bloque de 2 a 10 barra 12. Adelante Agustín. Bueno, buenas tardes a todos, eh, gracias por participar, por conectarse al foro técnico, espero que se encuentren bien. Les voy a hablar acerca de un trabajo de investigación que estuvimos haciendo en el Departamento de Investigación de RIPE. Esta es la lista de coautores y autores del, del trabajo. Bueno, voy a empezar por explicarles un poco de qué es esto de debogonizar un prefijo, comentarles por qué hicimos esto, qué herramientas usamos para poder debogonizar el prefijo y sobre todo a qué conclusiones terminamos llegando. Hace no muchos meses, eh, Ripe recibe de Diana un nuevo barra 12. Este, esto era algo que no ocurría hace bastante tiempo. Y la verdad es que estamos en un momento bastante especial. Porque en el momento que el RIR, en este caso Ripe, recibe el prefijo y antes de, asignar, de, de asignárselo a alguno de sus miembros, eh, es un momento en el que ese prefijo nunca fue visto en Internet, nunca fue asignado, nunca fue visto en la tabla de enrutamiento. Entonces queríamos saber un poco más acerca del comportamiento de ese prefijo. Un bogon, eh, el término bogon viene de, del inglés y bueno, hace referencia al tráfico que, que, el tráfico que circula a través de prefijos que aún no han sido asignados a ningún miembro de un RIR. Es tráfico que en realidad es tráfico indebido, no debería estar circulando por ahí. Entonces... Nosotros cuando debogonizamos lo que hacemos es tratar de detectar este tráfico y bueno, ver qué cantidad de tráfico es, qué características tiene. Este... Y bueno, entonces la pregunta principal era, una vez que Ripper recibe este barra 12, queríamos ver si a través de debogonizarlo podíamos sacar estas características del prefijo para ver si estaba apto para ser utilizado por miembros que empezaran a recibir asignaciones eh, parte de ese barra 12, ¿verdad? Entonces lo que tenemos a disposición son, bueno, tres herramientas. La primera es una simple captura de paquetes, donde vamos a capturar todo lo entrante a este barra 12. Lo siguiente es RIS, este, que es una herramienta de RIPE, es el observatorio de rutas, les voy a explicar un poco más adelante. Y también la herramienta RIPE Atlas, que lo que nos ayuda es a realizar mediciones activas de Internet, y también les voy a explicar un poquito más más adelante. Acerca de RIS, RIS, bueno, es este observatorio de rutas, es una plataforma que básicamente tiene dos eh, tipos de nodos, los nodos colectores, que son aquellos que eh, reciben tablas de enrutamiento de sus peers y a través de ese proceso aprenden cómo está formado el Internet, y también los peers, que son aquellos operadores como ustedes que deciden ser parte de este proyecto, que levantan una sesión de, peer con los, de peering con los colectores y les comparten eh, su visión de Internet. En la región de la CNIC tenemos el Route Collector 24. Este, les dejo ahí el enlace para todos aquellos que quieran participar de RIS. Pueden llenar el formulario y seguir las instrucciones y ser parte de esto. Pero lo más importante era este, qué nos podía ofrecer RIS a nosotros en, termas, en términos de información de este nuevo prefijo. Es decir, cómo ve, vemos este prefijo desde RIS. Y por otro lado, la plataforma RIPE Atlas, este, bueno, es una red de sondas que están distribuidas a lo ancho de todo el mundo. Y lo que nos permiten es, al igual que uno lanza un ping o un traceroot desde la línea de comando, nos permite lanzar pings y traceroot desde todas partes del mundo hacia los objetivos que nosotros querramos. Y entonces lo que podemos obtener de Atlas es estas pruebas de conectividad a través de ping y trace route hacia direcciones que están dentro de ese nuevo barra 12. Un comentario que les quiero hacer es que hace unos meses eh, largamos las sondas por software, hasta ahora las sondas habían sido solo de hardware, de ahora en más van a coexistir sondas de software y son, sondas de hardware, Corre en una variedad de plataformas y sistemas operativos. Este, para aquellos que quieran probar estas sondas de software, les dejo el enlace para aplicar a una sonda de software y poder ser parte de esta red de mediciones. 
Eh, lo único que requieren es una cuenta de Ripe Access, pero se la pueden hacer en menos de un minuto. Entonces, volvamos al experimento. Esta es la famosa gráfica de adopción de IPv6 de Google. Este, pero cuando nosotros nos, nos pusimos a investigar acerca de experiencias pasadas eh, en este mismo tipo de experimentos, de debogonizar un prefijo en IPv6, empezamos con situaciones allá por el 2006, donde se anuncia un barra 48, no se reciben más que 12 paquetes. Después en 2010 también un barra 12, algo más grande, del mismo tamaño del que hicimos nosotros. Bueno, en el orden de miles de paquetes. Después, unos años más tarde, también en coordinación con los cinco RIR, se anunciaron los 5 barra 12, se veía que se atraía una cantidad de tráfico aproximadamente de cientos de paquetes por segundo. Pero la verdad es que todos estos, todos estos experimentos fueron realizados, digamos, no los inicios, pero donde la adopción de IPv6 no era tan grande como era ahora en, en enero de 2020, que fue cuando hicimos el experimento. Entonces ahora hay más dispositivos, más capacidad de tráfico IPv6, más vulnerabilidades. Entonces nos preguntamos, si hacemos el mismo experimento hoy, ¿qué tanto más tráfico podemos llegar a traer y con qué características? Y entonces, lo que, la configuración que empezamos a hacer fue, les contaba un poco de RIS. Bueno, RIS eh, tiene estos nodos colectores que no solo reciben rutas, sino que también hacen anuncios. Y con esta capacidad de poder hacer anuncios es que nosotros hicimos de, anuncios de este barra 12, pero a su vez dentro de ese barra 12 delimitamos un barra 29 y dentro de ese barra 29 anunciamos barra 32 y barra 48 con distintas configuraciones con respecto a lo que es IRR y ROA. Para el IRR lo que hicimos fue eh, configurar un route object y para el ROA creamos el ROA de ese prefijo y lo que hicimos fue para cada prefijo ir intercalando la configuración de ROA e IRR. Entonces hay un prefijo que tiene ROA e IRR hay uno que tiene ROA pero no tiene IRR y luego al revés, uno que no tiene ROA pero sí IRR y otro que no tiene nada. Lo mismo para barra 32 y barra 48. Entonces, ¿qué hicimos? En enero fijamos una semana este, y la sucesión de eventos fue la siguiente. Creamos eh, hosts respondiendo en esas en ocho direcciones pingueables en 2.2.1 dentro de esos prefijos que les mostré en la diapositiva anterior configurados de forma diferente lo que hicimos fue iniciar una captura de paquetes eh, todo lo que era entrante a ese barra 12 lo empezamos a capturar luego comenzamos a anunciar el barra 12 anunciamos los barra 32 y los barra 48 más específicos Empezamos a lanzar mediciones a través de RIP Atlas. También hicimos un llamado a lista de operadores para que los propios operadores puedan probar desde sus premisas, desde sus equipos y con sus herramientas, cómo era su accesibilidad a este prefijo. Después empezamos a retirar los prefijos de tablas de enrutamiento y al final terminamos todas las mediciones y esa barra 29 que les contaba que delimitamos lo ponemos en un periodo de cuarentena que durante seis meses no va, a ser, no, no va a formar parte del pool que se le asigna a miembro de RIP. Al anuncio del barra 12 lo llamamos la fase 1, luego empezamos con la fase 2, y cuando hacemos el anuncio a la lista de operadores eh, lo llamamos fase 3. Si ponemos esta, línea, esta serie de eventos en la línea del tiempo, bueno, vemos lo que les contaba, fase 1, 2 y 3, esto es a alto nivel, este, la caracterización de tráfico según qué tipo de tráfico sea. Lo primero que vemos es que la mayor parte de todo el tráfico recibido es a través de RIP Atlas. Son mediciones que generamos nosotros y generaron otras personas para probar la conectividad hacia este prefijo, es decir, sería una especie de tráfico auto incluido. Y lo otro, que es la, son las líneas violetas al principio de la línea del tiempo, es un escáner TCP que detectamos que envió una serie un tráfico bastante alto al comienzo y luego no, no, no envió más tráfico. Entonces, esto es a alto nivel. 
si nos enfocamos en la primera fuente de datos, que es el escáner TCP, esas dos eh, líneas al principio, cuando lo empezamos a observar la captura de paquetes, empezamos a ver de que era tráfico que solo tenía el SYN flag encendido desde un puerto en particular hacia el puerto 80, servidores web. Los números de secuencia que los vemos en la gráfica de abajo no subían de forma incremental el uno, sino que subían en batches. Y algo curioso fue que este escáner en realidad no provenía de una única dirección, sino que provenía de dos direcciones que eran anunciadas por dos sistemas autónomos diferentes, desde infraestructuras diferentes. En particular, eran dos escáneres que estaban coordinados, donde iban tocando un barra 64 una única vez y luego se cambiaban de barra 64. Si bien es un comportamiento lógico, IPv6, si se quiere decir, ir saltando de barra 64 en barra 64, al anunciar un barra 12, si uno se va moviendo de barra 64 en barra 64, es lo que en inglés se llama quadrilliums. Uno todavía está muy lejos de la capacidad computacional y capacidad de red como para llegar eh, a escanear todo el barra 12 si uno va saltando de barra 64 en barra 64. Esa es la caracterización TCP. Si después seguimos en la captura de paquetes, este, una de las cosas que vimos es que Tuvimos paquetes de más de 6.000 direcciones de origen, incluidos los Probe de Atlas. Y una particularidad era, dado que nosotros eh, sabemos el origen, estamos parados en el destino con nuestra captura de paquetes, podemos saber qué paquetes llegaron al destino, pero no pudieron regresar al origen. Es decir, no hubo una respuesta del destino al origen que pudiera llegar. Este es lo que se llama el camino de retorno. En el dibujo, lo que les muestro es, si un origen quiere hacerle un ping a una dirección dentro del destino, lo primero que manda es un echo request. Después el destino lo que hace es enviar un echo reply al origen. Y bueno, en algún lugar del camino de retorno lo que puede pasar es que este echo reply llegue o no llegue al destino, al origen, perdón. Y en caso de no llegar, lo que le pasa al destino es que recibe un mensaje de error. Y ese era lo que nosotros podíamos detectar en la captura de paquetes. Alrededor de un 4% de estas direcciones eh, tuvieron problemas en el camino de retorno. Y esto, es, esto nos da trabajo para seguir investigando y ver por qué, quiénes son los generadores de estos errores. Les contaba que tuvimos gran tráfico de RIP Atlas y del escáner TCP, pero si vemos el tráfico restante, que era muy poco, pero es en sí de las cosas que más nos interesa, este, lo que vemos es que el nivel de tráfico es bastante menos. Digo que más nos interesa porque este es el tráfico no solicitado hacia internet, ¿verdad? En el momento que yo empiezo a anunciar un barra 12, de repente todo este tráfico me empieza a llegar. Y bueno, por suerte no son niveles de tráfico muy altos. Lo que vemos es, la mayoría fue tráfico ICMP, después TCP y UDP. Lo que vemos es que una particularidad es al comienzo de la fase 3, que fue cuando hicimos el anuncio en la lista de operadores, este, los operadores empezaron a mandar más tráfico ICMP a estas direcciones y lo, que, lo vemos en la gráfica que es esta curva que sube al comienzo de la fase 3. Cinco minutos, Agustín. Bien. Eh, entonces, si clasificamos en tres este tráfico y quitamos las direcciones que le pedimos a los operadores que hagamos ping, y una dirección donde tuvimos un detalle, básicamente lo que vemos es que tanto echo request como destination unreachable como time exceeded, eh, no, ninguna parte del espectro atrae más tráfico que otros. También si vemos los errores, quitando esas dos direcciones en particular, lo que vemos que hay mucho más destination unreachable, que quiere decir que hay mucho más errores relacionados a routing que time exceeded, que son más bien... Este, errores de timeout. Después, en cuanto a TCP, lo que vimos fue este, nada fuera de lo normal, búsqueda de, de servicios, búsqueda de vulnerabilidades en los servicios. Lo que sí vimos es que habían patrones de escaneo relacionados a IPv4, como barrer los últimos 16 bits o tener un máximo segment size que hace mucho más sentido en el mundo IPv4. Desde UDP, lo que, bueno, vimos varias cosas, este, muchas queries A y Quad A. En particular vimos queries eh, DNS hacia aviv.net, 
que es un servicio que retorna contactos de abuso. Y después, la verdad que vimos bastantes typos y errores de configuraciones que no vienen al caso ni son relevantes. Después, desde RIS, nos enfocamos en eh, ver cuántos peers de RIS podían ver estos prefijos. En particular, teníamos un prefijo de referencia, el violeta en la gráfica. Y lo que vimos es que, bien, el barra 12 no tenía buena propagación, como era de esperarse, pero sí el, los barra 32 y barra 48, que son las líneas chatas amontonadas que ven a la derecha. Y bueno, la visibilidad de estos barra 32 y barra 48 siempre fue por encima del 93%, así que no había nada en particular, ninguna observación en particular en cuanto a routing. Y en cuanto a Atlas hicimos lo mismo, tuvimos un prefijo de referencia, iniciamos mediciones desde todas partes del mundo, cuando contamos la cantidad de probes que podían llegar a estos prefijos y las relativizamos frente, ahí va, ahí las relativizamos frente al prefijo de referencia, veíamos que había eh, más de un 90% de probes que podían llegar a estos nuevos prefijos en relación al prefijo de referencia. Y entonces si resumimos estas dos cosas, este, si resumimos estas dos cosas, eh, lo que les quiero mostrar es que en esta gráfica cada prefijo es un punto. En el eje de la Si tengo la visibilidad según peers de RIS. En el eje de las X tengo la participación de sondas de Atlas. Más que nada están casi todos los prefijos ubicados eh, en los altos porcentajes, a salvedad de los barra 32 y barra 48, que no tenían ni ROA ni IRR que tenían, tuvieron un poquito menos de participación eh, de sondas de Atlas. Bueno, y para terminar, la verdad es que eh, a veces nos olvidamos de que no hayan eh, datos demasiado relevantes. En este caso es un buen dato, quiere decir que el prefijo tiene un comportamiento normal, puede ser asignado a miembros de RIPE. Este, como observación, eh, algunos, algunos comportamientos de lo que venía del espacio IPv4, eh, ver de que hay problemas en los caminos de retorno y tenemos que investigar un poco más acerca de eso. Y esta observación que les comentaba al principio del escáner TCP, que tenía dos orígenes e iba barriendo el espacio IPv6. Una nota que para mí es no menor, y los que trabajamos en mediciones de Internet sabemos, es que usar estas dos plataformas y este experimento bastante complejo a nivel global, a veces es difícil tener resultados que se validen, pero en este caso, por suerte, tanto RIS como Atlas eh, tuvieron, tuvieron resultados que estaban alineados. Y bueno, y con eso quiero darles las gracias, quiero pedirles que si tienen alguna duda o consulta, lo hacen en la sesión de preguntas o me, también pueden escribir directamente. Muchas gracias Agustín. Tenemos un par de minutos para preguntas antes de la siguiente presentación. César, ¿nos puedes compartir las preguntas recibidas? Gracias. Sí, gracias Macarena y gracias Agustín por tu presentación. Eh, tengo una pregunta eh, de Mariano eh, Kabakian, esto en donde comenta, me quise dar de alta y para monitorear en Atlas me pide créditos. ¿Cómo debo proceder? Sí, bien, lo primero que te sugiero es, eh, una forma de generar créditos de Atlas es ser host de un probe. Entonces, si vos aplicás para hostear un probe, vas a estar generando créditos de forma automática. Así que ese es el mecanismo por el cual te, te sugiero que empieces a generar créditos participando. Ahora que están los software probes, es mucho más fácil que vos puedas correr un probe en tus propias instalaciones. Así que te sugiero que vayas al link que dejé en la diapositiva acerca de aplicar un software probe. Vas a recibir las instrucciones y de ahí en adelante vas a poder tener créditos para poder generar mediciones. Gracias Agustín. Hiciste referencia a que te pueden escribir si tienen alguna duda o comentario. ¿Nos puedes repetir tu cuenta de correo electrónico para poder que, transcribirla a los, a los participantes? Cómo no. Es aformoso.ripe.net Perfecto. Gracias Agustín. Macarena, no tengo ningún otro, ninguna otra pregunta ni comentarios. Bárbaro, gracias César, gracias Agustín y a Mariano por la pregunta. Ahora la siguiente presentación es en inglés, así que sigo en ese idioma. Our next speaker is Karen O'Donoghy and will talk about the road to development, network time security.
Karen is the Director, Internet Trust and Technology for the Internet Society. In this role, she supports the development, deployment and operations of technologies, standards and best practice to improve the security of the Internet. Go ahead, Karen. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, hold on one second. Okay, <clears throat> good morning, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be here to talk to you a little bit about uh, network time security. Uh, just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I've been working for the Internet Society now for about 10 years, and uh, even prior to that, I've been working um, in the IETF on uh, the network time protocol and time synchronization in general. Uh, and I currently chair the IETF working group on NTP and the IEEE 1588 subcommittee on security. Um, so what I wanted to talk a little bit today was about time. Um, humans have always measured time. Um, it has always, it's uh, important in a number of ways. Um, and it's vitally important to a number of our systems and it's, it's a key part of our infrastructure, uh, but often it is an overlooked part of our infrastructure. Uh, in, in that uh, there are, there's a small community of people that uh, work on this in this space. And some of the areas where time is very important is like maintaining synchronization in um, power grids, um, actually your web security and the, the time stamps and, and uh, certificates require uh, quality time synchronization. Um, synchronization of, of transportation systems, the stock markets, uh, and even the original navigation problem was solved actually with time as opposed to, to uh, navigation. Um, so where does accurate time come from? There are, um, there's a very basic architecture that you can think in terms of and in, in that you have a, a time reference. A lot of nations have their own time references and all of these time references are coordinated uh, to uh, UTC. So for example, in the United States, uh, there's the UTC USNO, so that's a, a time source that's traceable to. Um, and then this time is disseminated in a number of ways. The most common way is through something like a global navigation satellite system, like uh, Galileo or uh, GPS. And then uh, it is distributed and synchronized through computer networks using NTP and PTP, uh, which is what uh, most of you all would already be familiar with. Uh, the network time protocol developed by the IETF has been around for over 30 years um, and is uh, pretty much comes installed by default in a lot of um, applications and, and platforms. And the precise time protocol has been developed by IEEE specifically for uh, higher precision and for hardware time stamping. Um, so there are these two basic protocols. Um, they both exchange time over a network a computer network for the purposes of clock synchronization, and then they use the information that's exchanged to determine the offset between two independent clocks, and then based on that, um, they make alterations to one of those clocks. Uh, they form, uh, they use different techniques for forming these, but they form a hierarchical tree structure that's the basis for that time information, and there's, uh, there's a little bit of differences in the architecture of the two, but they are somewhat resilient in the presence of packet loss. Um, the one thing about this is the time, uh, time community has, has long not, has, has not prioritized security um, because time in and of itself is not a secret. It, it's information that uh, the, the time of day is not a, a value that um, people have considered to be something that would be a threat that you would want to, to corrupt in any way. Um, and in the 20 plus years that I've been looking at this uh, or monitoring the, the evolution of, of time work in various communities, uh, it's never really been a high priority. And that's really changed in the last four or five years. And, and part of that is you see in continuing interconnection and decentralization. And the more you decentralize something, the more that you need to focus on the synchronization of the pieces that you've now taken apart. Uh, we also have increasing evidence of the impact of inadequate security. Uh, we see, um, you know, a number of incidents on a regular basis, and we see that 
interdependence between our security systems and our time synchronization. Um, and then also we have some additional uh, legal and compliance requirements. And these are becoming more and more stringent. So um, as I mentioned, attacks are occurring. There's a number of, of uh, documented accounts of this. Uh, vulnerabilities have been, uh, lots of vulnerabilities are being discovered. And what we've realized is that uh, in the NTP world, there's sort of three sources of problems. Uh, one is flaws in configuration and implementation. So these are things where uh, the protocol is, is um, it's not the way the protocol itself is specified. It's the way it has been configured in an imp in a operational system or it's a, or a bug in the implementation. Uh, the second source of errors that you see or the problems that you see are weaknesses in the actual protocol itself. And, um, and then the third is um, beyond the protocol itself is lack of any adequate security mechanisms uh, in the protocol. Um, and despite all of this, it's been, uh, here we say over eight years, uh, since there's been any sort of an updated specification for time synchronization security um, until this year. And um, there, there's been ongoing work in both IEEE and in the IETF for over eight years in both communities, actually. Uh, and this year, it looks like both of the um, communities will release updated specifications uh, specifically for time synchronization security. Um, the IEEE effort is currently in the final editing process uh, in the IEEE processes and the NTS document is in the IETF editor's queue, RFC editor queue, so that's both excellent news. So now we have these emerging uh, security mechanisms for both of these protocols. Um, and in particular, if we look at the IETF, um, we, I, I mentioned the three areas of the problems that we have, flaws in the configuration and implementation. Uh, in last year, an NTP BCP was published. This BCP collected information from uh, years and years of experience from the operator communities uh, and specified additional information on how to configure NTP so that it would be um, less vulnerable. Um, in the weaknesses in the protocol itself, uh, we published an updated MAC for NTP, uh, which deprecated um, HMAC, uh, deprecated, uh, God, I just lost the name of that one. It deprecated the, uh, the a, uh, crypto algorithm you shouldn't be using and put a more, put a, uh, a more recent version in its place. This is RFC 8573. Um, Additional weaknesses in the protocol are being looked at in the possible specification of an NTP v5 and also um, uh, some NTP client data minimization work. And then the third piece, which is really sort of the meat of what I wanted to talk about today, uh, is this um, uh, lack of adequate security mechanisms. And so we have uh, network time security, which has been specified. Um, so the network time security document uh, has been evolving in the IETF now for, for several years. It's gone through several, many, many iterations. And as of March of this year, it has been approved by the IESG and is currently in the RFC editor queue. So it's not quite published. It doesn't have an RFC, uh, but all of the technical changes to the document have been, uh, have been completed and we're at the final publication stage. So, um, so what does NTS do for you? Um, NTS, well, the original version of NTS, uh, we rolled our own key exchange and we did a bunch of, of uh, custom things and then uh, the security community reviewed it and came back and they were questioning why we would, why we would want to roll our own solutions. Uh, and so NTS uh, is based on TLS. Uh, and so it uses TLS to um, exchange key material, uh, and then it uh, uses NTS extensions for NTPv4 to secure the protocol itself. So it provides uh, integrity for the NTP packets. Um, it provides unlinkability um, 
once uh, in, uh, once NTP has been turned into an NTS session and also provided that the client is using data minimization techniques. Uh, it does Two reply- Two minutes left, please. Excuse me? Two minutes left. Oh, two minutes, okay. Um, anyway, it provides a bunch of, um, of uh, additional capabilities, key authentication of server and authorization of clients. Um, anyway, so at this point, it's really time to talk about deployment. And um, from a, there are several building blocks to deployment. There's the technology and standards development, which we've got. We've got prototype and preliminary implementations. We've done some initial interoperability testing. Um, and the rest of the steps are where we need to go next. We don't quite have open source uh, production quality open source. We're looking for commercial products. We need to develop tools and troubleshooting. Uh, we need to uh, deploy some preliminary deployments. We need to take that and develop some best practices and then move on to large scale deployments. So um, we have an internet society time security project and we've divided it up into four pieces. And we are looking to take us from that point of preliminary implementations through to guidance. So this year we'll be focusing a lot on setting up a distributed multi-party test bed, conducting some virtual test events, and developing some test and measurement tools. Um, and then taking all of that in the subsequent years and creating lessons learned in BCPs. Um, so uh, with that, uh, it's time to act. Uh, we are looking for some potential collaborators in this work. Uh, we've already talked to a number of folks that are interested in working with us. Um, and in particular, we're interested in network operators, developers, uh, potential testbed participants, um, any uh, time server service providers in particular, any uh, folks that are providing like national time services for their countries. Um, so, uh, if you're interested in working with us on a time security project, you can send me email um, or you can follow us on the Internet Society webpage. And with that, are there any questions? Thank you very much, Karen. Mariela, are there any questions for Karen? Tenemos alguna pregunta? I meant to say, here's a few resources that just a couple links that might be useful. I forgot to say that, so. Continua Cesar Macarena. Gracias, Macarena. Thank you very much, Karen. There is no, quest, no, no, no questions, uh, but it's uh, for a future reference or for a question. May you share us an email? Oh, yes. Um, it's right there. It's O'Donoghue at ISOC.org. So. Thank you. Thank you. No hay preguntas, Macarena. Gracias, Karen. Gracias, César. Eh, nuestro próximo ponente eh, también habla inglés, así que voy a continuar en ese idioma. Our next speaker is Richard Hamel, who will present Understanding the Cyber Threat Landscape. Richard Hamel has 11 years of experience in the intelligence field and is currently the Threat Intelligence Manager for Airborne Networks Asset Research Team. Welcome, Richard. Thank you so much. Uh, hola, buenos dias. And uh, that's the extent of uh, my English for all of you on the phone call. So bear with me here. Um, I'll try to make sure I get my um, words across. And I know we do have the transcript, so definitely please feel free to take advantage of that. Uh, so let me get my PowerPoint here. All right. I don't actually have the option to share my PowerPoint, so let me... Do this, I'll share my desktop. And now we can see it correctly, Richard. All right, so let me just get into presentation mode here and we'll, we'll get moving. Let's see. Okay, hopefully we'll, we're good there. Can you guys see it, everything, everything okay? Yes, thank you. All right, so let's jump right into this. I'm gonna rocket through this. I've got a lot of content to share. Um, 
the primary bulk of this is going to be revolving around DDoS, what we're seeing in the DDoS landscape, um, what it looks like from trends perspectives, what are attackers doing, how are they changing up their, their techniques really to take down networks, how they're advancing and evolving. Um, and so this uh, report and uh, presentation takes place kind of the second half of 2019. Um, and we compare that segment of time to the previous year's same period of time. And we do that specifically because when you think the end of the year, you have holidays, you have Christmas, you have Thanksgiving, you have all these different things occurring and, and naturally you see increased activity. And so what we'd like to do is compare one snapshot with the previous snapshot to see how things have changed. Um, so let's just dig right into this. Um, we're gonna talk about DDoS, we're gonna go into IoT. Uh, we're talking a little bit about the malware. Uh, I'll give you a little update on what's happening in the EPT world. So this is gonna be your um, country to country espionage type stuff. Uh, and then a little bit on crime, uh, what's happening in the crime space. Uh, so let's dig into DDoS. Here's, here's some of the kind of key things that we wanna pull up. Um, and you'll see that the title of this actually has uh, details about our, our WIZR, our 14th annual WIZR, which is Worldwide Infrastructure Surveillance Report. Um, one of the things that, that we did for this particular presentation is I pulled that out specifically because there's a lot of survey things and some of the actual breakouts and the different graphs and diagrams are um, a little bit hard to read in kind of this format. Um, but if you go to the link that I have here at the bottom, uh, netscout.com slash threat report, you can actually download the PDF and that'll give you all of the wizard data. So if you're interested in what uh, carriers and what enterprises are seeing in terms of DDoS and various other attacks. And it's not just specific to DDoS, it actually goes through and lists what are the top threats that an enterprise or a carrier network are experiencing in general across the landscape. Um, so it's definitely worth checking out. Um, so if you do have time, please feel free to download that and, and make sure that you're uh, tracking that as well. Um, okay, so some of the other things that we wanna do um, is look at the different techniques and tactics that attackers are using. Um, so there's actually seven different vectors that we've either identified or have seen attackers use more frequently. We'll get into those. Um, we'll talk a little bit about collateral damage, um, and then we'll go right into uh, EPT-related stuff, specifically on the mobile side of the house. Um, and then we talk about IoT, but a little spin here for intensification of threats, because things are getting bigger, they're getting badder, um, and it's getting a lot more difficult to mitigate some of these things. Um, okay. So this is just a really quick snapshot here. This is a call out specifically to uh, what we call Cyber Threat Horizon. Uh, anybody has access to this. In fact, if you go to the URL, anybody can register, you can get an account. Um, and it's cool because you're able to see attacks as they're occurring. It's near real time um, and you can create what we call neighborhoods. Um, and I bring this up specifically because a lot of the statistics that you're gonna see uh, later on, it's all derived from the data that we have fueling this dashboard. And so this is a really good way to get it kind of a high level picture of what's happening uh, around the, the cyber threat landscape specific to DDoS attacks. Uh, we have some plans to move into more malware centric stuff later with this in the future, but right now it's, it's primarily focused on the, on the DDoS space. Okay, so uh, a little spin on Guy Fox here. Remember, remember 8.4 million. So if you remember nothing else from this presentation, remember that's the number of attacks we saw in, in 2019. Uh, 23,000 per day, 16 per minute DDoS attacks. And these could be low volume DDoS attacks. It could be multi-vector. It could be single targeted UDP floods. Um, it could be your really large attacks. In fact, you know, we have the 1.7 terabit per second attack that occurred. Um, we recently saw a 1.2 terabit per second attack. And so sometimes they're high volume. More often than not though, they're actually uh, kind of smaller volumes. And I'll get into that in, in a couple slides here. Um, but first off, we identified seven new vectors or increasingly used vectors. Uh, some of the new ones would be ARMS, which is App Remote Management Service. So if you are, have a Mac and it's an enterprise uh, device, there's a really good chance that this service is enabled because your IT needs to get in and actually go in and do some management. Well, the byproduct of that is now you're vulnerable to be a reflector amplifier for these DDoS networks. Um, if me RMCP. So this is taking advantage of specifically hardware that has a vulnerability in it that allows for amplification of traffic. Some of these you've seen around for a while, OpenVPN, HTML5, Ubiquity, they've been around for a while, but we're seeing more and more use of them. Um, and we've got some cool narratives around these that I'm gonna get into in the following slides. Uh, 20.4 billion, this is the number of IoT devices that are projected to connect to the internet this year. Um, so that is a lot of IoT devices. That is a lot of footprint on the internet that attackers have access to and, and can take advantage of it. And IoT is a very scary space and we're gonna get into why that is here in the coming slides. Um, and this is just one reason why it's bad, right? Mirai. Mirai is the predominant IoT malware out there. 
and we're seeing a 57% increase from 2018 to 2019 for the number of unique variants that are circulating in the wild. Um, so you can clearly see on this chart on the bottom here, I mean, you go from 34,000 to end of 2019, we're talking over 220,000 unique MRI samples circulating in the wild. And when you look at kind of the evolution and the exponential increase of IoT devices, they're kind of growing together. And you see that as we expand our footprint, the threat continues to grow. Um, this is that intensification of threats uh, that we played on earlier. Uh, top four verticals, I show this um, mostly to say that there's really not a whole lot of change here. Um, it's your wired telecoms, your telecommunications, your hosting providers, wireless. Um, this is all par for the course. And what's interesting though is, is I would say about 90 to 95% of the attacks here. So when you look at the attack frequency, that's the account that we saw for this period of time, six months, remember. Um, so a million on wired telecoms, 575,000 on telecom. Uh, this predominantly is attacks against gamers. So targeting broad, broadband access points in order to take down networks of maybe com competitive gaming. Um, the the competitive the esports world is getting huge, and gambling on esports is getting even bigger. And there's millions and billions of dollars at risk here, and so. All it really takes is a very fast, very powerful attack to take down a network of a potential competition. And it only has to be for a couple of minutes, if that, in order to throw a match or for money to exchange hands. It doesn't have to be uh, really a long lived attack. It's not gonna be something that's gonna be the one terabit per second attacks. No, you just wanna get in there, you wanna disrupt as quickly, as efficiently as possible in order to do something, which in this case is motivated by most likely fame or uh, monetary gain. Um, and so a lot of times when you see these attacks and you see these particular high level verticals, um, that's what we're talking about is, is, is a lot of it is just gaming. Um, and wireless telecoms is in there because a, a lot of the Asian community uses wireless access points in order to do their gaming. Um, it's getting more and more popular. And so we'll, we'll see that trend kind of adopt across the world, um, but that's why these are here. Um, so one thing that's really notable though, um, if you actually look at the, the report that we have, we talk about different um, verticals that are there. And it used to be that we would have the top 10 verticals, what we saw, but there wasn't a whole lot of movers. So we kept the top four, but specifically the, the very left-hand um, call out here is around satellite telecoms. And we put this on here because what we saw, we actually saw some attacks and it really was kind of showboating. You had a bunch of these attackers out there um, and they were saying, hey, look what I can do, or they're trying to get more customers. There was some rumor that there was extortion going on here, but predominantly this is like showboating. And they're like, hey, we're gonna launch attacks against these financial inst institutions in Asia Minor and Europe. Uh, well, little did they know that a lot of the IP footprint for these uh, financial institutions was using satellite IP space. And so what happened is they started targeting all these telecoms with this new technique that we're gonna talk about on the next slide and the byproduct was that satellite took a pretty heavy hit and a lot of the network space got knocked out. Um, and so just because of that incident, we actually saw satellite telecoms as one of the top 10 verticals targeted by DDoS in 2019, um, which is a fairly significant increase because we've never actually seen satellite show up that high before. Um, the rest of these are just kind of some significance that we saw. Um, we dug a little bit into these, but really without some of the background on some of these, it's hard to kind of pick out a motivation for these. Um, sometimes what we'll see is like a new tool is released um, or there's more uh, reflectors amplifiers that are available or there's the, maybe there's a, the attacker that's always hitting them, but then all of a sudden now they have a new list of reflectors that increases the attacks against them or increases the potency. And so you'll see some of these kind of uh, have changes periodically. The last one there, uh, attackers eyeing airwaves, that's part of that wireless telecom that you saw on the previous uh, page, which as you can see a 600% increase um, year over year is, is pretty incredible. Um, okay, so DDoS attackers kind of innovating and adapting. What we're seeing here is there, it's kind of a threefold approach that we're seeing. Attackers are not only doing their recon, um, they're also monitoring the efficacy of their attacks and they're adding new techniques. So let's break these down. So what we're seeing with recon, we actually mitigated an attack recently where attackers, they scanned the attack, um, their targeted network, um, and they found out where the boundaries were. So as like a ISP or a carrier or a really big enterprise, one of the things you do is you have a network footprint, right? So maybe you have a couple of ASNs, maybe you have some cider blocks or, or what, what have you. Um, and you have that footprint. Now, anything in that footprint is kind of your home space, right? So you're more likely to tr trust traffic that's coming from your home space than something that's external to that. 
Well, attackers get wise to that as well. And so they start scanning these footprints and they identify, hey, this is the boundaries of what's good, right? So maybe they do some test packets and they figure out what the reply looks like, what the response looks like and say, hey, this actually works. So now what they're gonna do is they're going to try to get control of a lot of nodes inside that kind of home network. And then they're gonna use that as a platform to launch their DDoS attacks. That mitigates that first layer of kind of protections that maybe somebody has. Um, so they do that. They start launching attacks and maybe they choose uh, DNS uh, amplification. And so that's not working the way they want it to. They're doing some ping requests. Maybe they're checking down detector. Uh, they don't see any outages. Okay, let's pivot. Let's add a couple of vectors here, see if that works. Ah, that doesn't work, let's change it. Let's go carpet bombing. So now instead of targeting one destination, I'm gonna have the entire CIDR blocker ASN for that area, and I'm going to launch traffic at it in order to stay underneath the threshold of what would be mitigated by normal DDoS mitigation measures. So let's just say as an organization, I say I don't care about any traffic unless it reaches five gigabit per second uh, volume. So an attacker might test that. And so they might start launching attacks, attacks, see where that threshold is and when their stuff starts dropping off. Um, and then they back off. And then they take the entire CIDR block or ASN and they say, I'm going to send that volume of traffic to every single one of those destinations. Well, now you have this massive inbound flood of traffic saturating every single pipe and that creates just as many problems. But there's more. Let's add TCP SYN to that, which historically has been hard to mitigate for a lot of people. So now not only do you have all of these different vectors, now you have an entire new vector that leverages other capabilities that are very hard to mitigate. And not only that, you're targeting maybe tens of thousands of IP addresses all at the same time. It is a very effective tactic. And as attackers start monitoring, as their attacks occur, they can pivot on the fly super, super easy. And it's really hard for, as a defender, to mitigate all those different threads inbound. Uh, so it's a really important to stay abreast of all, all of these tactics that attackers are using. Um, and so really that's, the, that's one of the newest techniques we're seeing is this carpet bombing with the TCB SYN attacks. Um, and it has been very effective uh, in a lot of instances. Um, okay, so this, this is getting into the fun stuff. Uh, we did a did kind of a case study into the different vectors. Um, and I had a lot of questions, which I'll show you the questions on the next slide, but um, just to, to break this down on this chart for you, on the right-hand side, we have what we call our periodic table of DDoS attack vectors. Um, there's a lot of information here. And again, download the PDF. You can have this, you can blow it up. Maybe you can put it on a poster on your wall, whatever you want to do. Um, the top right is the maximum amplification factor that we have seen. So for instance, COEF version one is up there right now. So we have a 34 to one. So one packet generating 34, um, that's minutes. the ratio. Five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of really cool stuff in here. The little radials to indicate the number of reflectors we know about in the wild. Um, so I encourage you just to go and kind of dive into this a little bit. Um, okay, so getting into the kind of interesting things, here's my questions. How long does it take for, for a vector to get cleaned up? Does it grow? Does it decay as it's brought to light? And which ones pose the greatest risk? And my answer to that, well, it's, you can't really predict. Um, and the reason for that, and you'll see on the right-hand side, the daily growth or um, removal of these vectors, but this is kind of like a life cycle. Uh, you see co-op grows, you see uh, OpenVPN grows, you see some of these kind of level out and you see ubiquity go down. The story behind these is that co-op is part of IoT devices. So as IoT devices enter the network, the vulnerability increases. As more people move to use VPNs, OpenVPN increases. Ubiquity happens to be a protocol used in routers and in, in network devices that usually have admins behind them. So you see that diminishment of the available vectors because uh, IT personnel know this and they start mitigating that. Um, and so it's really interesting. And so the, the story is that we can't really predict uh, for all these different vectors. Um, now, this is probably the most interesting part of all of this. It turns out that attackers are using very few of the available servers out there. Uh, CoAP is a really good example. In fact, for CoAP, we had uh, roughly somewhere in the millions uh, of devices. But when you actually look at attacks and you see how many servers attackers are using, they're using less than 0.5% of the available reflectors amplifiers for that vector. Um, that is huge, right? And so when you start looking at the size of CoAP attacks, we've seen 300 gigabit per second attacks. And if they're only using less than 0.5%, that's pretty significant. So what happens when an attacker decides, I'm gonna use every single co-op server out there to launch my attack? What happens then? We don't know. Um, and so there's a lot of outstanding questions here. Um, and that really like, just really quickly will blast through the IoT section here. Again, 20.4 billion, 57% increase in IoT devices. 
and you see on the right hand side all of the OS architectures that Mirai is ported to. Then you see 51% increase in brute forcing attacks, 87% increase in, in vulner, uh, exploitation attempts. All of these paint a picture of what it looks like as attackers are setting up these networks. And that all plays a role into the number of reflectors amplifiers that we saw on the previous page that are used for attacks. And so this thing is very real, it's very, very concerning. Brute force versus exploitation chart on the left, right hand side, top 10 passwords again, download the PDF. Um, but notably here at the top, there's a few kind of movements right now for securing our devices, but it's not enough. You have the OWASP pro project, you have ETSI, you have California Senate bill where use uh, adequate level of security for these. But what does that mean? What does it mean to secure IoT device? Because as a, as a manufacturer, I want to pump these things out as fast as I possibly can. I want to make them user friendly, which means is a user really going to plug in an IoT device and the first thing they do go to the admin panel and change the default credentials? Probably not. Um, and so it's a very concerning area that we need to be cognizant of because as enterprises, as carriers, uh, there are tons of IoT devices either in our or organizations or for, for our consumers. So what are we doing to mitigate these? It's something that we all need to be concerned about. And I've got a couple minutes, sorry, uh, one minute? Two, two minutes. Two minutes, perfect. Okay, so mobile malware, uh, a lot of the APT adversaries that we're seeing, they, they use it to track their own internal citizens, whether they're, they're dissenters, they're protesters, they're journalists, they use it to kind of monitor and do censorship. They also look at near abroad uh, uh, countries. So right across the border, looking at kind of geopolitical interests. Um, but not only do they create their own, they also leverage third party services. And so here's um, three different countries that we see. China uses uh, something called Poison Carp and Caller Spy. Vietnam uses both custom and third party. And then Iran uses uh, Gulf Spy and this mobile anogram. Um, and they use these to infect not only their own people, but also external folks for monitoring. We're seeing the growth of this. And then you have third party organizations like Hacking Team and Finn Fisher that have over the counter commercial solutions for this APT malware that they're, they're able to leverage. Really quick on Emotet, um, this is a deep dive specifically in Emotet. There's a lot more details in the PDF, um, but we wanted to look at like, what does it look like? Because Emotet and then TrickBot are the two predominant families in the crime space right now. Um, and so one of the things we focused on was let's get to the source of threats because it used to be Emotet distributed TrickBot. So in my mind, the theory is if we block Emotet, we also block TrickBot. And so when we actually look at the numbers, it's true, right? So over a six month period of time, you have the same amount of samples for Emotet and TrickBot. We have 300,000 notifications of victims of Emotet, but only 50,000 for TrickBot. So that theory works. And so that's what we do here is we try to get kind of closer to the source for mitigating these. And it works from a threat landscape perspective, you want to kind of cut the head off the snake. So if we can get it at the earlier stages of an intrusion, then we can block any follow on stages. And this is true for any really downloader type malware that maybe distributes ransomware or some other uh, secondary payload. Thanks, um, so that's it, perfect, good time. <laughs> All right, any questions, let me know. I'm happy to answer anything you guys have. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Cesar, are there any questions for Richard? Hay alguna pregunta? Sí, gracias, Macarena. Esto sí tenemos una pregunta. Thank you very much, Richard. We have one question. Uh, Kevin may, may, may uh, ask uh, a question for Richard, please. Sí, gracias, César. Eh, la pregunta viene de Eduardo Preve. ¿Con qué frecuencia se producen los ataques que dijo diarios por hora? Habló de un millón de redes de telecomunicaciones y más de 575 mil en ataques a las comunicaciones en información y los procesos de datos hosting servicios relacionados en la nube. También dijo que se pierden billones de dólares debido a estos ataques. Hay una estimación de una cifra real de pérdidas de los ataques. ¿En qué regiones se pierde más dinero? Okay, uh, I, think, I think I've got it, don't worry. I, I, I used Google Translate, my, my cool Kung Fu here. Um, so uh, you're talking about number of attacks, um, whether that's daily, hourly, um, talking about the different verticals, telecommunications versus others. Uh, but then what that means for actual losses for organizations. So one of the things that we identified actually as we were doing this exercise was we wanted to find out what that dollar amount was. We didn't actually get to in this threat report, but it's something that we're considering doing for the next one. And so we do these reports twice per year. 
Um, and, and there's a lot of question around what does this mean from a monetization standpoint for a carrier network and enterprise? What, what dollar amount does it actually cost for these organizations for DDoS, right? Because if an ISP is, is predominantly defending against these disgruntled gamers that are 13 year olds paying $50 on the underground to launch attacks and they're spending millions and millions of dollars for this, that's kind of a, a frightening concept that a 13 year old can literally cost you millions of dollars in damage. Um, and that is something that we want to do. I will say that we haven't got to it yet for the statistics that I just showed you. Um, and as far as the actual numbers we had, so 8.4 million attacks was for the course of 2019. And then that's equates to about 23,000 attacks per day, uh, 16 attacks per minute. Um, and again, those statistics are in the PDF. So I definitely encourage you to get those and then you can, you can look at those, but stay tuned for the next report because I really do want to do some of this. What does it mean for an organization? What is the kind of dollar amount there? Um, and, and it's something that's kind of near and dear to us, especially since we live and breathe this and this is kind of how we make our money, right? So it, being able to go to a customer and say, hey, this is actually, uh, the cost benefit analysis is something that we want to do from an attacker's perspective. We already do that in the business sense, right? So that's what our SCs and our sales reps do is they, they look at the kind of the environment and competitive Intel. Well, I want to look at it from what actual attacks cost. Um, and so, yeah, so that's something we're, we're planning on doing for the next one. We also have another question from Oscar Cárdenas. ¿Qué medidas preventativas se pueden tomar para evitar los ataques para los dispositivos de IoT en los dispositivos perimetrales de seguridad? What measures are taken to avoid attacks on IoT devices? Um, that, on device. Yeah, perimeter. yeah I, I've got it. Um, that's, that's a tricky one. Uh, and this is why IoT is so scary to me. When people ask me, like, what are you most scared about? Um, in the coming years for, for threat intel, it is IoT because what can you do? It used to be people would say, well, let's put it behind a firewall. But the reality is, is there, there's lots of malware out there now that can actually get around a firewall. So does that really make sense? I don't know. Um, it doesn't make sense to just say, hey, as an enterprise, you're not gonna bring any non-approved device into the office um, because we don't wanna risk that. Um, as a consumer, how do you do this, right? Can you go and tell all of your consumers that, hey, you're running vulnerable versions of IoT and, and you're contributing to these DDoS? Well, maybe that's something that we can do. But the reality is the, the responsibility on this really goes down to what is law being able to enforce on the manufacturers to put in measure, uh, like an adequate measure of security into these devices. They have to be able to have non-default credentials and passwords because brute forcing these devices is what Mirai is good at and it's still king. It's the primary way that IoT devices are compromised. If you go back a couple of reports that we did, any IoT device connected to the internet within five minutes starts to receive brute forcing attacks. Within 24 hours, it's getting exploitation attempts. And so it's, it's very imperative that manufacturers are cognizant of this fact and start securing the devices. And that's really where we have to start. We have to come together as a community and say, this has to happen. And if it doesn't happen, we need to do take some drastic measures to say that we're not going to allow these in our networks because it is a very real threat and it's very very difficult to mitigate. Thank you, Richard. Uh, and the last question, uh, Kevin. Eh, con nodo, no se menciona ransomware en los incidentes presentados, pero cada vez más en reportes de seguridad se mencionan estos casos. ¿Cuál es su percepción de los riesgos de ransomware frente a los ataques presentados? Yes. Ransomware, yeah, uh, yep, ransomware is, is uh, I, every time I get asked this question, uh, I have to pause because I, the, my previous organization, I, I was working for FireEye and prior to that, iSight Partners, and that was my bread and butter. I was the ransomware go-to person. Um, and I know how, how scary ransomware is. I know how it's distributed. I know all of the ins and outs of it, even the latest ones such as Maze and various others that are kind of making rounds. Um, and here's the reality. So from, from our perspective, at least from Netscout's perspective, one of the things that, that we try to do is we do have the capability to block outbound C2 comms. Uh, but let's face it, if you have a ransomware malware family that is beaconing out to command and control, chances are it's already encrypted. So at that point, what can we do? So this it goes back to the last slide that I presented before the conclusion here is that we try to get closer to the source of an intrusion or an infection vector. And so one of the things that I've instructed my team to do is let's focus on what distributes these other malware families. How is Maze ransomware getting inside networks? 
How is TrickBot? How is all these other banking malwares? How are all these other ransomware families getting in? Is it spam messaging? Is it malicious macro documents? Like what is the primary method? Um, and it turns out it's a very varied. In fact, a lot of the more recent ransomware scares haven't actually occurred through something that you can mitigate with an indicator of compromise because what they're doing is they're brute forcing vulnerabilities in devices such as RDP or using SMB uh, lateral transfers. Um, let's go back to JBoss, right? With SamSam targeting like health institutions and various other local governments. Those are vulnerabilities in inherent um, services running on systems that they're first brute forcing. They get a foothold, maybe they do whatever they want. Maybe they exfiltrate data, maybe they look for certain things that they're interested in. And then, oh, well, guess what? Let's just deploy ransomware anyway. So not only did we steal all your data, but now we're actually gonna hold it ransom um, and get an additional kind of leg up on you. And so for things like that, the best advice I can say is that you need to have uh, adequate patching. Um, so as vulnerabilities come out, as use cases come out, as proof of concept code comes out, you need to make sure you're patching immediately. Um, and I know the patch cycles can last a long time in some organizations, but it's imperative that that happens. Um, and then you want a legate approach. You don't wanna have all of your crown jewels directly exposed or even one hop in. You wanna be able to have some segmentation so that if an attacker did get in, they couldn't pivot laterally to your systems. Maybe that's some form of two-factor authentication where you have to have physical access to a machine. I don't know what it is, but um, that legate approach is also really critical. Um, being able to have those backups stored in a place that you can't reach uh, any other way except physically or some other uh, method that doesn't connect to the rest of your systems. Um, those are kind of the best practices that I have for ransomware right now. Um, if it's distributed by email, making sure you have a good email uh, filter provider, some, some type of iron port or something like that that monitors for malicious attachments, uh, URLs and things like that. So more and more we get these questions about ransomware and really it, it's tough for me wanting to do something and knowing that if you see C2s for ransomware, it's already too late. Um, and so we're doing the best that we can to get closer to that source of infection in order to mitigate uh, the ransomware piece. Thank you, Richard. Uh, no more time. Uh, just so for future reference, uh, may you confirm us an email to question or, or yes. whatever? Yes. Um, so I had it on a slide, but it's richard.humel, H-U-M-M-E-L, at netscout.com. And yes, feel free. I'm happy to do any kind of follow-up question and answer. Thank you. Eh, no más preguntas, Macarena. Adelante. Thank you, Richard, Kevin, and Cesar. Please send Joel an answer question to the speaker via the email address he already published in the chat feature. Thank you, everyone, for participating in this session of our first LACNIC event, LACNIC 33. We, would lo uh, we look forward to seeing you again at 17 UTC in one hour. Uh, in the same Zoom meeting. We'll be back to continue with the LACNIC Technical Forum. Gracias a todos por participar de esta sesión del primer evento online de LACNIC, LACNIC 33, y los esperamos a las 17 UTC en una hora en esta misma sesión de Zoom. Continuaremos con el foro técnico de LACNIC. Los esperamos.